Hello, my name is Milt, and I'm the lead pastor here at Birchridge. And if you're relatively new, welcome, and welcome home. You are indeed wanted and welcome and needed here. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask. And I also want to welcome our online guests today. Thank you for joining us. And would you consider hitting that little subscribe or like button below the video? Thank you, you're awesome. And if you are relatively new, or maybe you just have a prayer request or a praise report, or maybe you're simply wanting to update your personal information in our data system, like giving the pastor everybody's birthdays and anniversaries so that I can celebrate with you, you can just write that information on a connect card and then turn it in when you leave here today or drop it in the response box and it'll get to me. And if you'll do that, I'd really appreciate it. Listen, at Birchridge, we don't pass the plate but we firmly believe that God uses our faithfulness with our finances to provide for the needs of his church. You can contribute to the ministry here at Birchridge by giving in person in the drop box at the rear of this room, or you can go to our website at birchridge.org and click on the give button at the top of the screen. And from there, you can either give one time or you can give recurring. So, God bless you as you joyfully commit to what God's doing here. Many times people want to know what the purpose of a church is. And at Birchridge, we want the whole world to know why we exist. And we repeat it often so it stays with us all through the week. So, let's say it together. What's our purpose? Leading people to become fully devoted followers of Jesus. Very good. Again, welcome home, and may God richly bless you today. Hello there. Thanks for joining in for our next message in the series called God Never Said That. But before we get started, please help me recite our family declaration. Are you ready? Here we go. Your word, O Lord, is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Therefore, I will hide your word in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Very good. Today, we're going to begin in Acts chapter 16. So if you have your Bible, please turn there. And as you find your way, let me set the story up just a little bit. Paul and Silas were in prison. It's like midnight. And they decided to have a little worship service. Now, remember, they weren't in prison for armed robbery here, okay? They were in prison for not shutting up about Jesus. So here they are in prison for preaching Jesus, and it's midnight, quiet hours, obviously, and they decide to have a jam session, a worship service of sorts, right? And all of a sudden, God sends an earthquake that miraculously broke open the prison doors and unlocked the chains from their hands and their feet. The jailer makes his rounds with his LED flashlight, and as he shines it on the bench where Paul and Silas were supposed to be, he sees nothing but bench. He freaks out, and he's about to kill himself for letting them escape, and then he realizes that they are not gone. Acts chapter 16 and verse 29. The jailer called for lights and ran to the dungeon and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? <laughs> Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And the answer? Well, it depends on who you ask. Because seriously, there's a lot of different people that hear a lot of different answers to that question today. I mean, you ask the Pope, you'll get an answer. You ask Dalai Lama, you'll get a different answer. You ask Madonna, you'll get an answer. You ask Franklin Graham, you'll get an answer. And you ask Oprah, well, you'll definitely get a different answer. Lots of different opinions to that one question. For example, when I was in seminary, I had a factory job in the evenings. And there was this lady I worked with and she had some messed up beliefs. And she didn't like me very much and you'll see why in just a minute. You see, she believed in reincarnation. And she knew I was a Christ follower. She ran a press machine and I was quality control. So every so often I would have to make my way to her machine and measure some parts to make sure that they were still within tolerances. Okay? And so, I mean, literally, without fail, each time I would come by, she would ask me what I was going to come back as in my next life. Over and over I would tell her, I'm a Jesus follower. I don't believe in reincarnation. 
Finally, after countless times of this same scenario, she asked me this question and I had had enough. She asked me what I was going to be in my next life. I looked at her and I asked her, well, what are you going to be in your next life? She smiled and said very confidently and quickly that she was coming back as a tree in France. <laughs> I was like, a tree in France? Wow, you have some really high aspirations for the afterlife. <laughs> she said, well, I told you what I was going to be. Your turn. And so I thought about it for a second. And I said, so you're coming back as a tree in France, huh? She said, yep. And so I replied and said that I would come back as a dog in France. <laughs> And now you know why she didn't like me too much after that. Um, and today, today we're such a melting pot of diversity that we have adopted a melting pot of theology as well that says it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you're sincere in your beliefs. However, the Bible says that Jesus is the one and only way to heaven. Acts chapter 4 in verse 12 says, Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And yet for many people, that just seems so narrow-minded. Don't tell me that Jesus is the only way to heaven. I mean, that's just so exclusive. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Jesus isn't exclusive. He's all inclusive. Jesus said, whosoever will, right? Whosoever will. I'm a whosoever. Y'all are whosoevers. We're all whosoevers. The invitation is to everybody. But the route to get to the Father is very exclusive. It's through Jesus and Him alone. Glory be to God. I mean, even Oprah says that as long as you're sincere in what you believe, it eventually will lead you to heaven. Did you know that? And did you know that 53% of Americans believe that if you were generally a good person, you'll go to heaven? I mean, without a single need of Jesus, if you're just a decent person, you'll end up in heaven. Really? Here's the deal, church. Listen, listen, listen. The devil is not an idiot. He's a washed up, has been defeated enemy, but he's no idiot. He will allow the biggest lie in the world to contain just a smidgen of truth and then sell it as absolute truth. So what I want to accomplish today is to get us to agree on a few basic principles to provide a firm foundation of truth. Does that sound good? Good. Watch this. I'm just really searching right now. I mean, my favorite professor doesn't even believe in God. And my roommate is part of this totally different religion that's it's actually pretty interesting to me. And then there's my boyfriend who just kind of picks and chooses from different religions. You know, I, I always thought I knew what I believed about God. Now I'm just not sure. Well, the good news is it doesn't really matter what you believe as long as you're sincere. I shouldn't even have to tell you this, but God never said that. I do believe that sincerely look like it hurt. You got one on your hair, it's hilarious. Okay, so here's what I want you to do. No matter what you believe about Christianity or how you were raised, let's just take an honest look at Jesus. Can we do that? So let's look at, number one, look at what Jesus taught, okay? Look at what Jesus taught. You can hate Christianity. You can despise Christians because we're hypocritical, and unfortunately we are. But let's just take a look at what Jesus taught. And after doing that, you'd have to admit that what he taught was beautiful. I mean, a person could pick from a multitude of scriptures, but let's look at one. Luke chapter 6 and verse 27, it says, But to you who are willing to listen, I say love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who hurt you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, offer the other cheek. If someone demands your coat, offer your shirt also. Wow. I mean, if you just take a look at what he taught, and no matter what you think about Christianity, you've got to admit that if the world lived the way Jesus taught, <laughs> this place would be an amazingly awesome world. Would you agree? <laughs> so 
Secondly, look at the miracles Jesus performed. I mean, look at the miracles that Jesus performed. The scriptures describe how Jesus caused the blind to see, the deaf to hear, the mute to speak, the lame to walk. He healed the sick, turned water into wine, made a raging sea obey him, and he raised the dead. What's interesting to me is that the people who hated Jesus, the people who sought to discredit him, they never once denied the miracles that he performed. They didn't. They simply wanted him to stop. They never said, oh, Jesus didn't do that. No, they just wanted him stopped. Number three, look at the resurrection. Look at the resurrection. Now, this is a very significant part of the Christian faith because it's upon this belief that we hold everything as a Christian. I mean, Christ, if Christ didn't rise from the dead, then we're duped. We're miserable people. We're still in our sins and we have no hope of heaven. Yet the Bible claims that Jesus was God in the flesh became sin for us, shed his blood for our sins, died on a rugged cross, and the Bible says that on the third day, God raised him from the dead. Here is where you really have to ask yourself, did this really happen? I mean, look at what Peter had to say. Acts chapter 3 in verse 15. He said, you killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead, and we are witnesses of this fact. Peter said, we are witnesses to this fact. Now, there are a couple arguments to this. Some argue and say and deny the resurrection by saying that the Roman soldiers took the body of Jesus. Possible. But on that very Easter Sunday morning, right, when the women went out to anoint the dead body of Jesus and they found the tomb empty and then they sprinted back to tell everyone the good news that Jesus was risen from the dead, you have to know that the soldiers would be very quick to say, uh, 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 he's right here in the storage unit, see? Right? That doesn't hold any water. So, some people argue and deny the resurrection by saying that the disciples stole the body of Jesus. Again, possible. But think this through. We know that Judas hung himself. We know that John died an old man on the Isle of Patmos, right? But the other 10 disciples died a martyr's death. Now, what's a martyr's death, you ask? Basically, they were confronted with the opportunity to deny Jesus or die a horrific death. And when asked to deny Christ, they instead chose to die. Really? All of them would choose to die for a lie? I don't think so. I mean, at some point, We've got to step back and ask the question, do you really expect any rational thinking person to believe that 11 small town, average, uneducated men devised the most ingenious scheme, pulled it off, kept it a secret, all so they could cheat the world into being a better place and then choose to die for a lie? Come on, right? And finally, look at what Jesus claimed. Look at what Jesus claimed. John chapter 14 and verse 6. Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. I am the way, not one of many ways. I am the truth, not one of many truths or a partial truth. And I am the life, and no one gets to the Father except through me. Those are very exclusive claims. I mean, no one else ever made claims like that. Nobody, not Muhammad, not Buddha, not Confucius, or even Joseph Smith. Look at what he taught. Look at the miracles. Look at the resurrection and look what he claimed. And after you look at these things, we're left with basically three options. Number one, Jesus is a liar. I mean, he's just a liar. Possible, right? But here's the challenging part for me. If he was a liar, sooner or later he would have caved in, right? I mean, he's pulling off this elaborate scheme and it's going well for like two and a half years or so, right? And then he's arrested and they start to whip him with that whip that has pieces of glass and jagged stone and sharp bones and heavy lead weights tied to the end, right? Yeah, somewhere like lashing 37, right? When his internal organs are starting to hang out, he'd be like, I was just kidding, my bad, this is just a big joke, ha ha, right? Or if not then, maybe when they were beating him with those big honking rings, right? Blood everywhere, his face unrecognizable. 
And I guarantee you, if he would have survived that, before he let them nail him to a big chunk of wood, he would be like, oh, sorry, I was just, I'm just a carpenter. I was bored. You know, I thought this would be fun, but it's not. I quit, right? If he was a liar, he would have caved. Option two, Jesus is a lunatic, right? You know, crazy, certifiable. It's possible. I mean, there are people like that in the world. I've met some. Some of them are you, right? <laughs> The story is told of this insane asylum that had been fenced in uh, and a pretty busy business district had been built around it. People would take their lunch breaks and, and stuff like that and, and go walk, go for a walk around this windy sidewalk that was right next to this insane asylum fence. Many places on this privacy fence were signs that said, stay back from the fence. Well, one day a man was walking along on the sidewalk and he heard this voice from the other side of the fence. He paused and he listened, but he couldn't quite make out what the voice was saying, so he got a little closer. And he could hear this voice saying, 13, 13, 13, 13. And his curiosity was piqued. And even though the sign said, stay back from the fence, he couldn't help himself. He noticed a knot hole in one of the wood planks. So he slowly got closer to the fence and he put his eye up to the hole so he could see what was going on. And then all of a sudden, boom, he gets poked in the eye with a stick and the voice says, 14, 14, 14. <laughs> so, so Jesus is either a liar or he's crazy as a loon like Hitler or Koresh or he is who he says he is and Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. There's your options. You can do whatever you want to with him. You can write him off as a bold-faced liar. You can dismiss him as a crazy lunatic or you can get down on your face and call him Lord. One time Jesus was with his disciples and they were arguing back and forth. You know, some people say that you're this guy. Others say you're Elijah. Some say you're a liar. Some say you're one of the prophets. And Jesus cut through it all and he looked at Peter and he said, Peter, I don't give two flips of a wooden nickel what they say. What I want to know is what do you say? Who do you say that I am? And that's the question that I would like to respectfully ask you today. Who do you say that he is? A lot of people will say, Jesus is my Lord. And I'm not asking what you say with your lips, but rather, what does your life say? Who do you say that he is by the way you live your life? Many rattle off a good Sunday school answer, but their life says something completely different. Who do you say that Jesus is? You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you You are here Working in this place I worship you I worship you You are here Moving in the midst I worship you I worship you you are here, working in this place I worship you, I worship you You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Oh, you are. You are here, touching every heart. I worship you. I worship you. I worship you. Oh, you are here. Man 
worship you. I worship you. I worship you. You're working, you never stop, you never stop working, you never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God. That is who you are. 